Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and this is the second part of So You Want to Know About the Bible. This is a series that is designed to give Christians good, solid information on where the Bible comes from, its reliability, and also the tools to engage meaningfully with the culture around us. This particular session is about how we got the canon. In particular, it talks about the origin of a lot of the books that are in the canon itself or are often associated with the canon but are not actually in the canon. Next time, we will be talking about how those books uh, were received and how they got transmitted through history. So this time we're talking about where they came from and then next time we're going to be talking about basically how they traveled down to us. So this time is mostly where things came from. Now, to review a little bit, uh, last time I, I gave everybody a handout on uh, uh, to just kind of help them get some ideas uh, down about some things that we learned last time. Last time we learned uh, about the different categories of scripture, and we also uh, learned why. What, uh, how to identify if something is canonical or not. And I gave you guys a list of books, uh, including the Book of Mormon, the Quran, Song of God, Gospel of Thomas, and so on, everything that's listed there on the screen for you. And uh, I stated that uh, these are all books that are not in the Bible. And I gave you guys the task of figuring out what kinds of scripture they in fact were, and then giving reasons as for why they weren't in the Bible. So you first figure out what kind of scripture they are. Are they orthodox? Are they ecclesiastical? Are they canonical? Whatever. And then you figure out why they're not in the Bible. Is it an issue of authority? Is it the case that it just simply wasn't written by the right kind of person? Um, is it an issue of agreement? Does it not agree with something that was already established? Is it an issue of authenticity? Does it, does it actually have a his, Is it a part of the historical record or does it pop into existence at a later date? These are the kinds of questions that when people are asking about the Bible and they want to know if something is valid as being biblical or not, these are the qu kinds of things that you need to be able to know. So, th that is what you did last time. You wrote on that a little bit. It was a, a, a fairly short little bit of writing. Hopefully you didn't do a lot of writing on it. This time I would appreciate it if you would actually share your findings with somebody near you. Find somebody and tell them what your two works were. Tell them how you classified them and then try to explain to them, in your own words, uh, why they're not in the Bible. I would say take about four minutes total to do that, and then uh, come back, and, uh, and then we'll come back, and we'll continue with the rest of our, of our discussion. So um, go ahead and pause the DVD right now, and share with a neighbor your two works, what kind of scripture they were, and why aren't they in the Bible. All right, and we're back. Let's uh, go ahead and move on. So we've reviewed a little bit from last time, and this time we're talking about uh, where the books themselves uh, came from. What was the historical situation? Now, when we're talking about books of the Bible, and we're especially when we're talking about where all of this came from, when we're going back to the beginning, the beginning of the Bible, of the written Word of God, begins with Moses. He is what we call the first covenant prophet. Now, the word prophet is used in the Bible all over the place, Old Testament and New Testament. And something that is very important to realize is that it's not always used in the same way. There are different shades of meaning. And there are also different shades of meaning that occur in pretty much every other language with most words that you have. For example, you could tell somebody uh, that back last summer you went back home and that while you were back home you attended a backwoods lecture on while I'm not a hollerback girl and when you arrived all the front seats were taken so you had to sit in the back which was really unfortunate because the back of your chair was really uncomfortable and you wind up having a sore back but nonetheless you still liked hanging out with the people and so someday you might go back. Did you notice all the different ways that the word back was used there? It wasn't used in the same way every single time. And if you were to translate that into another language, 
odds are that there would not be a word in another language that would be able to fill all of those meanings. You would have to use a few different words to get across uh, the correct meaning at the correct time. It always depends on context. How is it being used that actually determines and how it's being that actually determines what the meaning is. And the same thing occurs with the word prophet. When we are talking about prophets relative to the Bible, we're talking about covenant prophets. People who are writing the word of God that establishes the relationship between God and mankind. That is uh, the kind of person who writes scripture. They're a covenant prophet who's writing terms, who's writing a declaration of the status between God and mankind. And it was Moses who was first chosen to write out those terms. Okay, in Exodus uh, uh, chapter 34 and verse 27 is one of the places, there are actually a few places in the Pentateuch in the first five books that talk about uh, Moses being commanded uh, to write, but and being the one through whom uh, the written word is delivered, but it was Moses who started the written word. Now there are people before Moses who are referred to even as prophets. For example, in Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7, Abraham is referred to as a prophet, as a navi, as a navi, but um, he is not referred to in a prophet in the same way that Moses is. When Abraham is referred to as a prophet, he is being referred to as an intercessor. God uh, tells Abimelech, who has basically just stolen Abraham's wife, and Abimelech is, has realized that he stole uh, Abraham's wife, um, and he's apologizing for it more or less, and God says, Go to Abraham, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you. Well, in that context, the word Navi most properly means to intercede, and in fact, Navi has a general meaning of intercession, and because of that, it gets used all over the place. Anytime anyone could be uh, described as an intercessor or as a mediator, you can see the word prophet. And so, Abraham gets described in Genesis 27 as an intercessor and it gets translated as prophet because we tend to translate the word the same way regardless of the context. But in that context it means an intercessor. When we get to Moses though, when Moses is described as a prophet and when the other author, authors of uh, the Bible are described as prophets, um, the authority behind the Bible more specifically is uh, the prophets, we're not talking about just being an intercessor. They're an they're intercessor in a sense, but they are more specifically an intercessor in the sense that they are revealing the covenant of God. They are re uh, revealing the condition between God and man. And so that's what we're talking about. Um, so the written record begins with Moses. And every prophet who would follow uh, basically follows in Moses' footsteps in that sense. He is someone who is writing the relationship between God and man. Now, and so uh, Moses started this out by writing out uh, the first covenant, uh, the terms of the first covenant. He's the one who gave us the books of the law. And the books of the law uh, declared the righteousness of God. You, you see the commands of, uh, in there of, uh, of the God who is a jealous God, the God who does not wor admit worship of anybody else, because he is the only true God, and if you're worshiping anyone else, you're in error. You're doing what is false. You're doing what is wrong because there is no other God. Uh, you are dishonoring him. He is the God who also uh, demands that uh, we be holy in our uh, lives, that uh, we do not lie, we do not uh, steal, we do uh, not murder, so on and so forth. This is a God who has holy and righteous requirements. And frankly, this freaked the people of Israel out Moses led them out of the land of Egypt, saved them from the land of uh, slavery, brought them to the mountain of God, introduced them to God, and the people's reaction is very telling. The people came to the mountain of God with its thundering and lightning, and they saw the power of God for themselves in a very real and manifest way, and they realized immediately, God is a holy, righteous God, and I'm not. And the people freaked out, they became scared, and they said to Moses, let us not see this great fire anymore, lest we die. They realized 
that there was something that was wrong in the relationship between God and mankind, and that the problem was on man's side. Man was wrong. And so they said, please, please, uh, uh, please don't uh, let us see this great fire anymore lest we die. I like the way that Paul puts it. Paul says that the, the first covenant, that the law, was put in place to stop our mouths. That's what uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 3. That the purpose of the law was basically to declare mankind's unrighteousness. Not that we weren't unrighteous beforehand, but that the law made it clear and apparent. Just as God's righteousness, his holiness, his, awesome, his awesomeness became clear and apparent to the Israelites when they came to the mountain of God. That's what the first covenant did. It declared that there was a problem between God and mankind. God is righteous, mankind is unrighteous. So, because of that chasm that existed, because of that fundamental difference between God and man, the people asked for more covenant prophets. Moses was given to reveal that initial issue, the righteousness of God compared to the unrighteousness of man. And he introduced the people uh, to God and they said, let us not see this great fire anymore lest we die. Instead, how God send us someone like you? Someone who can intercede for us. Someone who can stand in as a mediator. Another prophet. Because that's basically what a prophet is. It's someone who is an intercessor in some way, shape, or form. And specifically, someone who could pronounce on God's behalf. Not only someone who would intercede, but someone who would reveal the words of God in written form. So they were not just asking for intermediaries, not just prophets, but for covenant prophets. And God acquiesced the request. He said, yes, what they've asked for is good. That is, it is appropriate to recognize that there is a division between God and man. And it's appropriate to ask for an intercessor. But the way that it was revealed through Moses was very interesting. You see, Moses, when he said, okay, God is going to allow this, God is going to allow for more covenant prophets to follow, Moses put it in the singular. That is, there is the understanding that prophets are going to be coming, who are going to be like me, who are going to reveal the righteousness of God. And that's what all of the prophets have in common, is that they reveal the righteousness of God in written form, in some way, shape, or form, that the written form is authorized through them, or <clears throat> more specifically. They all have that in common, but Moses still leaves it in the singular because what he's indicating is that there is going to be someone who's going to bring fulfillment to this. That this condition that exists now is going to be fulfilled. There is, that this uh, problem that exists between God and mankind it is going to be taken care of. There is a solution. There is someone who is going to stand in the gap. And of course, when we get to the New Testament, we figure out exactly who that person is. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus uh, says, I came not to abolish the law and the prophets. I came not to abolish, but to fulfill. When Jesus said that, he was declaring himself to be the prophet of promise. He was declaring himself to be the final prophet that would bridge that chasm. And that is how Christianity has always understood Jesus. We do believe that he is not just a prophet, but that he is the final prophet. He is the one who fulfilled the first covenant. The first covenant declared the righteousness of God. Christ fulfilled that righteousness of God. So, to recap, the Bible begins with Moses. There are other people in the Bible who are talked about as prophets, but not covenant prophets, not writing prophets, not prophets who wrote out the status of the relationship between God and mankind. So it begins with Moses. That first covenant revealed that there was a division between God and mankind, righteous God, unrighteous mankind, and it was a division that God promised he would ultimately fulfill in one single person, one final prophet. That prophet that we as Christians know to be, that Christ himself declared to be as the Christ, as Jesus of Nazareth. 
Right, so that's where it started. Okay, but there is a little bit of an issue that comes up. If you say, okay, God is going to allow other prophets to come, and he is going, and these other prophets are going to speak the righteousness of God to you, just like I, Moses, have, then there becomes an interesting question. Isn't it possible that there might be some people who will stand up and say, I'm a prophet, just to take advantage of the situation? It is indeed a possibility. And so Moses, before basically just leaving them to their own devices, instead, he gave them a set of requirements that prophets had to fulfill. This is how you'll know if somebody is false, is basically what Moses did. He actually gave quite a few requirements, but the two big ones are these. First of all, if a prophet made a false prediction, they were not a true prophet. That is one of the easiest uh, ones that is out there. If they are truly speaking from God, they will be able to get it right. God is the God who exists outside of time. Time is a part of our creation in the biblical historical worldview. God is outside of that. He sees all time. He knows the future. He knows the uh, present. He knows the past. He knows all time. So he should be able to get the future right. And if the person doesn't get the future right, they're not really from God. So that was a, a, an easy test to apply. If they couldn't get this one right, they're not a prophet. But the bigger one, though, uh, was the one that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 13. And that one is the requirement that prophets must speak in accord with what was first established. That is, they could not lead the people away from their previously known God. If they did that, they were not only disqualified as a prophet, but the people were actually to stone them to death. You had to speak in agreement with what was previously given. You could not lead them to follow any other God. You could not come in and say, but God is really like this, or God is really like that. No, the God that was there at the beginning is the God who is there at the end. So you had to speak consistently. These are the two major tests that the Hebrews apply to the prophets to know who was a false prophet. So you have Moses starting this, and then you have people who follow Moses, that God chooses for the time and place to declare his, his righteousness to the people, to declare the relationship between God and man to the people at various points in history. And there, it's not like uh, one prophet comes on the scene and they just basically abandon what the previous prophets said. No, they had to write an agreement with the previous prophets. And so the only way that you can know if the prophet who's speaking now is truly a prophet if he's not leading you into some other uh, belief system is to know what was believed at the beginning. And so they would keep all of the writings from the previous prophets as well. But it didn't just stop there. Not only did they preserve these writings, but they also would occasionally modernize them. And this is extremely important. That is, from time to time, uh, the different Hebrew scribes would go through the scriptures and they would make sure that the people at their time and place could understand them. That was very important. This It was the scriptures themselves, what the, the previous prophets had said, that were used to test new prophets. That testing device is only useful if people can actually understand it. So from time to time they would go through and they would modernize uh, the text and make sure that it was in form that people uh, can know. Uh, one great example of this is found in 1 Samuel, chapter 9 and verse 9. There are other example, examples as well. But in 1 Samuel 9, 9, let me go ahead and just look it up for you. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 9, and then verse 9. This is talking about um, when Saul... Um, went uh, to visit um, a prophet of God and the terminology for prophet had actually changed. Just like words change in English uh, now. For example, if you looked up the word texting, 
and a dictionary that comes earlier than the 1950s, you're not going to find it in there. Texting is a modern concept. It's a modern word. And, and so new words are added and they sometimes f uh, take the place of older words. And this is something that had happened at the time uh, that the scribe was going through what has now become 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 9, 9 says, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. And then they went off and to the city where the man of God was. That's verse 10. But here you have this explanation in the text of the terminology that is being used. And sometimes they wouldn't necessarily explain the terminology. Sometimes they would replace the archaic words with more modern words. For example, the book of Genesis uh, talks about the city of Ramses. Now, in the time of Genesis, the city of Ramses didn't exist. Um, that was something that came about later, of course. But uh, later scribes used the city of Ramses in the text because that's what the people then, later on, knew. It was, some, it was a landmark that they understood. And so they would modernize the text from time to time so that people could still understand where different things were, they could still understand the terminology, so on and so forth. Very important uh, principle. You want people to understand the text in their own language at their own time, and so you make sure that they do. And this is why modern Christians, um, modern biblical historical Christians, are very adamant so that people have the Word of God in their own language in a form that they can understand. That is why biblical historical Christians are really big into things like Bible translation. It's because we want everybody to understand it for themselves so that they can test what is true and what is not for themselves. They need to have access to the truth. But eventually, the first covenant came to a close. Now, this was prophesied through uh, Moses that there is eventually going to be uh, a final prophet who would bring fulfillment to the first covenant. There were, that there was, in effect, going to be a second covenant, a new covenant that would fulfill the old which means that the old had to come to a close. And what's interesting is that all the sources from that time period are all in agreement that the first covenant prophets ceased. Now, there are later uh, groups that would disagree with that. For example, the Catholics would disagree that um, the time of the first covenant prophets came to a close because they like some of the books that come from the in-between time. Um, say, for example, uh, the Wisdom of Sirach and the uh, Wisdom of Solomon and books like that. They consider them to be a part of the canon. Uh, however, if you look at the sources that actually come from the time itself, they say that the time of the First Covenant came to an end. Uh, for example, the, the book First Maccabees. First Maccabees is not something that you'll find in a Protestant Bible. It's part of the Catholic Bible. It's part of the Eastern Orthodox Bible and groups like that. But you're not going to find it in a Protestant Bible. And the reason why you're not going to find it in a Protestant Bible is because of what the book it says about itself. And for, in First Maccabees 9.27, the text states very clearly that the events that are recorded in it happened after the first covenant prophets ceased to be seen in Israel. That is, the time of the first covenant prophets had already come to a close by the time of the events of 1 Maccabees, which means that 1 Maccabees wasn't written by covenantal prophets, which means it's not a part of the Bible. It's not canon. Now, the Catholics ignore what the text says, and on the basis of their tradition, on the basis of what they have come to use, they accept it as canon, even though the text itself says that it does not meet the most basic requirements of actually coming from a prophet. And this is what tradition does to people. Tradition blinds people to what even the text itself will say. People become comfortable with certain things. They get used to certain things, and they basically just assume that it means what, it wants, what they want it to mean, rather than actually looking at the text and seeing what it has to say about itself. But, of course, even canonical scripture itself agrees with this assessment. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, starting with the very first verse, says that God spoke long ago through the prophets, but now he has spoken to us through the Son. The book of Hebrews implies that there is a time gap between the two, between the first covenant and the second covenant, between the old covenant and the new, between uh, the original declaration of God's righteousness and the fulfillment of God's right, righteousness. Hebrews is very clear that there are two covenants.
Uh, and you also find this in other writings of the time. Josephus, for example, was very clear in saying that the later books he and did not believe to be canonical. And he was a Jew. He wasn't even a Christian. He was a Jew, and he stated very clearly that the later books were not canon. If you look at the sources from the time, they're all in agreement on this. It's only later groups, based on their tradition, basically based on what uh, they've grown to be accustomed to, without actually thoroughly looking into it, that say that these other books that come later should be accepted, that are the in-between books should be accepted more particularly. So the time of the First Covenant Prophets came to a close, and a lot of things in history are not exact as you would uh, want them to be. That's just the way that history works, especially the further back you go. But it was finalized around 450 BC, probably within 25 years either side of that. That's a good approximate date. And the sources for that would be Bava Bathra and Rashi, uh, Rashi to Megillah are some sources that you can look up that will talk about the, the finalization of the Old Testament. And it was finalized through a very interesting process. Um, as I said before, you had these prophets who would come at different times and they would uh, live their lives, they would speak their uh, peace, and of course then they would die, but their records were still maintained. And it got to the point that um, by the 5th century BC is what we're talking about here, it got to the point that they actually had a large number of records. Uh, some of the more conservative estimates that in some of the, the surrounding works like 2nd uh, 4th Estras, for example, we'll talk about this, um, talks about somewhere between 200 and 900 books depending on what uh, variants you read, but 200 to 900 books that had been written by previous prophets up until this point. Um, and of course that's a lot of material to go through. And remember the, remember the whole reason why the uh, scribes would sometimes modernize the text in the first place. The scribes would modernize the text so that people could have it in a form that they could use. And if you're dealing with 200 to 900 different books, it's not really reasonable to expect your average person uh, to be able to get through all of that material in any reasonable time frame, and certainly not to remember uh, in all, of the, uh, all of the germane details from those books. And so, during the time of the final prophets, and by the way, the final prophets are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, during the time of the final prophets, it was decided that they would take all of these different records and they would compile and consolidate them down, especially of the older ones, uh, especially the older, older records. Uh, they would compile and they would consolidate them down into something that was much more manageable. And this is where most of the books of Israeli history uh, come from. They're, they're made by taking a bunch of the different writings of the prophets that existed and putting them all together in one source. What they essentially did for a lot of the books that are now in the Old Testament is they essentially made a history textbook. They went out and they gathered all of the sources, they compiled them, and then they basically put it all together in one smaller package that was much easier to use. They consolidated it. But nonetheless, from time to time, they'll still talk about the sources that they used to get these works. So, for example, in 2 Chronicles 12.15, we read this. Now let me just find it. 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 15, we read this. Now the Acts of Rehoboam, from first to last, are they not written in the Chronicles of Shemaiah the prophet and of Iddo the seer? There were continual wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, and Abijah his son reigned in his place. Now did you notice that? They mention this place where you can find more information about Rehoboam. They say all of eh, the things that Rehoboam did from first to last, they're written in the chronicles of Shemaiah the prophet and Iddo the seer. Now if you look in the Bible, you're not going to find a book of Shemaiah. You're not going to find a book of it Iddo. They're not there. Why? because those were the previous works that were used to make the works that we now have. Chronicles was made from Shemaiah and from Iddo. So we still have their record, but we have their record in a consolidated form. And it was done under the authority of the last prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And it was also done under the final three great leaders, um, uh, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. So under their authority, the previous records were taken and compiled into something that was useful. 
and occasionally they'll still state what the source is. And this is exactly what you expect of a good history textbook, is to actually tell you what the source is. Um, I remember when I was going to CSI to the College of Southern Idaho, I took a history class and I looked at the history book that I was given, flipped to the end of it, and at the end of a history book, or any kind of textbook, what do you expect to find? You expect to find a bibliography, you expect to find a list of references. I got to the back of it and there was nothing there. I was a little bit upset, to say the least, because that's not what a good uh, history book or any other kind of textbook does. They should list their sources. And that's exactly what the Old Testament does. In a great number of places where things have been compiled and consolidated down, you'll have these occasional references, especially in uh, the books of Israeli history, where they'll say, by the way, this is where we got this. We got this from the book of Shemaiah. We got this from the book of Iida. We got this from the book of Ah uh, Ahijah, from the book of Gad, and so on and so forth. Now, there are some groups out there that call these source books lost books of the Bible. And frankly, that is stupid. That would be like opening up your textbook, flipping to the end, finding the bibliography, and saying, look at all of these missing chapters. Nobody does that with a bibliography. You don't go to the bibliography of a book and say, look, the book is missing chapters because of the bibliography. That's stupid. But that's exactly what some groups like to claim. Well, you don't have the book of Ido anymore, therefore your Bible is incomplete. Well, the book of Ido was never a part of the Old Testament. It, was, it is what was used to make the Old Testament, but it was never a part in the first place. That's not what Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi authorized. What they authorized is what we have. So if you have an issue with the form of the Old Testament, take it up with Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They're the ones to blame for it. That's If you want to have an issue with them, go, go have an issue with them. But the point is that this process was done under the supervision of the prophets. It was done through the final three great men. And this is what Christians have historically, and Jews have historically understood about these books, is that they are basically a history textbook of the faith. And they were made in this compiled, consolidated form so that every person could have reasonable access to them instead of forcing somebody to read through 900 different works and remember all of the important details. The emphasis has always been on putting the level of responsibility down to the lowest level possible, making sure that each individual has the resources that he or she needs to make a decision when it comes to important matters of the faith. That's exactly what scripture is supposed to be. It is a handbook. It is not the exhaustive Enchiridion. It is a usable resource. And that was the understanding. That is why the Old Testament does not include every single source that was out there, but instead is a consolidation of them. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, like I said, there are groups out there that like to claim that they're lost books, but the problem is that they were never in the Old Testament to begin with. The Old Testament is made from them, and the Old Testament cites its sources, which is a good thing, but it's not reasonable to say that they're lost books, any more than saying that a history textbook is missing chapters because it has a bibliography. The sources that are mentioned in a bibliography are not missing chapters of a textbook. In the same way, the sources that the Old Testament cites are not missing books of the Old Testament. They're the source material for the Old Testament. It's an important difference to understand. All right, and moving on from there. So, the time of the first covenant came to a close. And like I said, all of the sources are in agreement that this, uh, that this event happened, that the time of the Old Testament prophets did in, indeed come to a close. And this is something that the, the Israelites were aware of, that God would send uh, a famine on the land. Not a famine necessarily of food or drink, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You can read about this and say Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, for example. This was a familiar concept to them. So the time of the first covenant prophets came to a close. You no longer had the authoritative mouthpiece of God speaking anymore. The covenant prophets, the ones who are writing the words of God, are not there. But the people still have questions. There are certain parts of scripture that are not as clear as other parts. Now, what biblical historical Christians have done when they get to those parts is they remember a very simple maxim. 
and this is in modern terms, understand, this is not what they're saying in the ancient world, but the modern equivalent of it is essentially major on the majors, minor on the minors. That is, those things that are clear in scripture are clear for a reason, and that's because they're a reason. <laughs> that's because they are important. That's the reason why they're ah, so clear, is because this is something that is essential. But if something is a little unclear, something's a bit obscure, it is best not to dogmatize about it. Nonetheless, though, there are certain groups that would take those unclear parts, those obscure parts, those things that people weren't quite exactly sure what the text was saying there, and they would basically make up a story for it to explain what it is saying. One of the, the classic cases of this is Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, it says that the sons of God looked on the daughters of men, found that they were uh, beautiful, and took them for their wives. And the text isn't entirely clear about what that means. What is Son of God referring to? Is it referring to uh, godly men who looked on the daughters of men, who looked on wicked uh, women and started taking them for their wives and were corrupted by so doing? Is sons of God a reference to angels? Because sometimes the, that phrase, sons of God, is used in reference to angels in other places in the Bible. Is it saying the angels... Uh, took women for their uh, wives, that w uh, the angels took uh, women and had sexual relations with them? Is that what it's talking about? Those kinds of things. Well, there were some people who, instead of just leaving it alone, they instead to, decided to create backstories for these things. And so you get books like the Jubilees and Baruch and the, and the books of Enoch. And there's actually multiple books of Enoch. But the books of Enoch were written specifically to address this issue in Genesis chapter 6. And it takes um, the view that it was angels who had sexual relations with women and all this kind of stuff, and it goes on into great detail about all of these things. It's actually a fairly long uh, work, and it actually became very popular. So popular, in fact, that they started writing sequels. Um, and there are at least four books of Enoch that were, that were written. Uh, they became a part of the popular culture at the time. However, they were based on something that was unclear in the text, and they made a big deal out of it. Um, this is not something that, of course, winds up making it its way into uh, the canon, though. And the reason for this is, first of all, this is after the time of the covenantal prophets. Okay, so it wasn't authoritatively written. But second, it demonstrates a faulty attitude re uh, regarding God's revelation. The biblical historical view has always been that God is clear about what he wants to be clear about, and that... He is unclear about what he chooses to be unclear about. And it is best to let God be God, to let him to choose to reveal what he's going to reveal, instead of taking it upon ourselves to fill in the gaps. Instead of making mountains out of molehills, we need to emphasize what God emphasizes. What he makes clear is what we should be trying to make clear to others instead of trying to make a big deal about things that are literally only sometimes a couple of lines in the text. Although there's quite a few modern Christians who do this, unfortunately. They'll take this one particular passage that could frankly be read in many different ways, and instead of focusing on the clear parts of Scripture, they'll take this one little phrase that could be said in many different ways, and they will make it the basis of everything that they talk on, and everything that they study, everything that they do, becomes this one little side issue. And what you wind up getting is the creation of these little Christian hobbies. Instead of people focusing on the fundamental aspects of God's word and the gospel, you will instead get people who are interested in this side issue, and this side issue, and this side issue. And it's not that these side issues can't be studied at all. Like I said, it's a Christian hobby. It's not necessarily a Christian vice. Although, when you start uh, becoming addicted to it as it will, as it were, to the point where it's the only thing that you really want to think about and talk about, then it does become a Christian vice. Like I said, the best position to take on these things is to major on eh, the majors, minor on the minors. What is clear is clear for a reason. What is obscure is obscure for a reason. Don't dogmatize on the unclear, but make sure that you do dogmatize on what is clear. If scripture clearly says that this is how something is, then that's how it is. But if it's not clear about uh, this or that or the other thing, then it's not clear. Let it be what it is instead of trying to fill in the gaps for yourself. That's exactly the problem that these people had.
they didn't like uncertainty. They wanted to know everything and they wanted to know it exactly, so they made up stories to fill it in. And it made sense to them. And they believed that they were right, some of them. And there's others that would uh, list it as basically just being fiction. But the point is that it came from a wrong obsession. But of course, those were not the only kinds of works that were written at that time frame. And there were also uh, people who lived in that time after the first covenant prophets, uh, but before Christ came, who are still saying, well, the people still need to know and understand the word of God. And so what they did is they wrote instructive works that were based on the Old Testament works that they had. They basic, and they were basically going through the scripture saying, well, this is a synopsis of what we have. It doesn't contain everything. But here is a way for people to be introduced to these concepts. And that's, to a large extent, what these were. They were introductory books, or they were commentary books. But they were instructive in some sense. They weren't meant to take the place of the canon of Scripture. Instead, they were meant to augment. They were meant to assist people. They were meant to introduce people to these things. And so you have the Wisdom of Sirach, for example. And it still very clearly says in this prologue that this is made for people who newly join the, fa uh, join the faith. That this is made for people who are just being introduced to these things. It's an introductory book. You also have the Wisdom of Solomon, which is, as it says, it's a, a collection of wisdom written in the honor of Hannah Solomon. Uh, Fourth Maccabees is basically a, a book on uh, Hebrew philosophy, if you will. Um, somewhat of a boring read. Most philosophy books are, to be honest. But still, it comes from that view of trying, uh, basically, to put all the pieces together uh, for people so that they can see what's going on. So, but these books don't make it into the canon of Scripture either. Like we said, first and foremost, it's because the First Covenant came to a close, and so these books are not authoritatively, uh, authoritatively written, but also because of a, another important principle. The first principle that we learned from books like Jubilees and Beirut and Enoch and those ones is that you shouldn't dogmatize on what is unclear. Here, when we're talking about Sirach and Wisdom and 4th Maccabees, we need to make sure that we don't confuse the commentary for the source material. That is, these things are a commentary on the Old Testament. They do not take the place of the Old Testament. And there's a lot of Christians who wind up making that mistake nowadays. There's lots of Bibles that are out there that are study Bibles. And I believe that having a study Bible is a good thing to have. It's a useful resource. But there are a lot of people who trust their study notes more than they do the text itself. The study notes sometimes will are written with a little bit of bias, shall we say, and they'll wind up basically making the text say something that it doesn't. And people will latch on to the commentary and its explanation rather than actually checking to see if that's really what the text itself says. And this is the problem that some groups had even in the early days. They would write these works for the purposes of being instructive, which is good, but some groups held to the commentary more than they did what it was commentating on. That's an issue. So the reason why Protestants especially do not have these books is because we don't want people to make the mistake. Is it bad to have these books around? Is it bad to read these books? Not necessarily, as long as you understand that they're commentary, that they're supposed to be instructive, but they are not canonical. They were not authorized uh, by the prophets in any way, shape, or form. This is not the final standard. This can help you understand the final standard, but it is not the final standard itself, and that distinction needs to be made. So is it bad to read them? No. But... Um, you have to remember that they are not canonical. Helpful, maybe. Canonical, definitely not. And then, there's one final uh, category of books that also comes about in this time period, um, and this is the commemorative works. These are works that are written to celebrate uh, various Hebrew heroines, uh, heroes, Hebrew history, to celebrate these kinds of things and make sure that people remember them. This is where the books of like Judith and Tobit, uh, First and Second Maccabees, possibly Esther, where these kinds of books come from that uh, talk about particular events in Christian, well, it kind of winds up becoming a part of Christian history, but specifically Hebrew history, um, that are important for understanding Jewish identity, as it were. This is a part of Hebrew culture, a part of what has made us who we are. Now, some of these books are not always the most accurate in every single detail. Um, 
especially in the in the sense of matching up uh, with uh, certain other chronologies and there's just kind of issues in history when you try to do that anyways um, and so there's there's definitely some looseness that uh, that kind of happens there sometimes but uh, they weren't necessarily written to be uh, perfectly accurate in every way instead they were written to get the point across that you know your culture who you are is important and understanding where you come from and what your people have done and, and the kind of attitude that is supposed to be engendered by your people and these kinds of things. Um, tales of sacrifice, tales of perseverance, um, simple obedience, uh, things like this. The, these are important things culturally for the people to understand about themselves and so that's why these work come into play. Um, but again, these works uh, did not become well established in Hebrew uh, in the Hebrew culture until after uh, the first covenant prophets had ceased. Uh, and I mentioned Esther as being possibly one of them, just because Esther um, Christians had uh, doubts about Esther as to whether or not it was one of the canonical works or whether or not it was one of these commemorative works. And that's why Esther is actually placed in the Old Testament in the position that it's in. You'll notice that pretty much all of the books of Israeli history in the Old Testament, um, starting with Joshua, they're pretty much all in chronological order. You have Joshua, Judges, Ruth, you have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, which basically just restates everything from First Samuel to Second Samuel. And then you get the skip. Second Chronicles basically ends with Judah going off to exile in Babylon. And then you skip over the exile and you get to Ezra and Nehemiah, which is talking about when the exiles returned. In that interim period is where the book of Esther fits. Esther is during the exile. But Esther isn't put where it chronologically goes. It's not put between Second Chronicles and Ezra. Instead, Esther is put after Nehemiah. It's put out of its chronological order. And the early Christians did that intentionally to say that this book might not belong with these other books. Now, we'll talk about that in more detail and exactly what that means and doesn't mean, but the main point that you guys need to understand now is that the reason why it wound up being uncertain is because the book of Esther in and of itself isn't actually a doctrinally uh, important book. It is not a book from which we get any core doctrine or theology. It can be used to support core doctrine and theology, but it is not used to derive any of it. When you're, say, developing the, the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. There's a few places in the book of Esther um, that maybe you could kind of hint at it, um, maybe just hint at it, but you're not going to get any core derivations from Esther. When you're talking about uh, the prediction of the Messiah, you don't have anything like that in Esther. And this is why um, Esther is kind of left in kind of a, a quasi-canonical uh, state, kind of semi-canonical state. It's because it can be used to support certain doctrines, but it's not essential to them. And so Christians usually didn't worry about it a whole lot one way or the other. But we'll talk about that in more detail next time. All right, so we've gotten past the intertestamental period. The first uh, covenant has come to a close. There were people who wrote other works still, sometimes from rather impure motives, trying to fill in details that probably shouldn't have been filled in, people who are trying to be instructive, people who are trying to commemorate the culture and their history. But then the final prophet comes, that final prophet being Jesus Christ. He is the one who fulfilled the Old Testament. And this is also, incidentally, the reason why in Revelation chapter 15, and specifically in verse 3, um, the song of Moses and of the Lamb is sung. The reason why in Revelation it puts these two people together is because they represent the bookends of canonical scripture. The first person to give us canonical scripture was Moses. All of the later canonical scripture is authorized through the final prophet, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the one who died for us. This was the understanding of the early Christians is that indeed Jesus was the final prophet. Um, there were some people who uh, looked at John the Baptist's life and noticed that he was doing some uh, pretty amazing things, and they asked him, you know, are you the prophet? And John the Baptist was very clear, and he said, no, I'm not the prophet. I'm not the, uh, the one who's going to come to bring fulfillment to all this. Instead, John the Baptist said, but the one who comes after me, 
is before uh, for me. He is the one whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. He is the one that you should be looking to. He is the Lamb of God. He's the final prophet is effectively what he's saying. What's interesting though is that this final prophet, Jesus Christ, he came to fulfill the Old Testament through his life, death, and resurrection, but he himself didn't actually write anything. Instead, he chose 12 men to be his apostles. And this is something that sometimes we have in the Old Testament as well. We'll have prophets who will actually choose somebody else to write for them, somebody else to publish their work. For example, the prophet Jeremiah published his uh, prophecies, at least a good number of them, through Baruch. Baruch was basically his scribe. It was his person who put his writings down for him. And this is what Jesus uh, chose to do. He chose 12 men to be his apostles. And this is capital A, apostle, by the way. Apostle is a lot like the word prophet. Prophet can be used in lots of different ways in the Bible. The ones that we're interested in for canonical scripture are the covenantal prophets. And in the same way, the word apostle can have a very general meaning, but when we're talking about ones that are relevant for scripture, we're talking about those who act as legal representatives, who have a legal right and also a legal responsibility to testify concerning uh, Christ. These are the people who had been with Jesus during his earthly ministry, and because of that, Jesus called on them to represent him. It's kind of like the idea of having an attorney. Uh, an attorney is someone who has the legal right and responsibility to represent you and your interests, uh, as it were. And that's the same way that the apostles were acting. They represented uh, Christ in a legal sense. And that's what Christ declared them to be. He, from his disciples, he selected 12. In Luke chapter 6, he declared them to be apostles. And it, he chose them to be this uh, because they had been with him during his earthly ministry ministry, John 15, 27. And this is important to understand. These were people who had to be with Jesus during his earthly ministry. Okay. He's the final prophet, his representatives, his advocates, his attorneys, if you will, are people who had known him, who had spent a considerable amount of time with him, who had been trained by him. And so Apostolicity, capital A Apostle, is something that is limited in time and place. And the Apostles actually make that really clear in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, um, Christ has just ascended, and the Apostles are basically getting ready to go and preach the gospel to all the world. And they want to make sure that they have a full complement of people to go out with. They had started with twelve and they wanted to go out with 12. But there was a problem. Judas Iscariot had betrayed Jesus, and after betraying Jesus, he realized his error and wound up killing himself. He committed suicide. And so they were one apostle down. And so they said, okay, we'll choose uh, a replacement for uh, Judas. And they were really specific about what the requirements for a replacement were. An apostolic replacement, capital A apostle here, is someone who had been with Jesus from John's baptism all the way up to Christ's ascension. They had to have lived during that time period and been with Jesus as a part of his ministry during that time period. Why? Because these people were the legal representatives of Christ. They were his attorneys, if you were. These are people who had to know what they know. And this is why Peter, for example, in 2 Peter 1.16, he says, We didn't follow cleverly devised myths. Instead, we were eyewitnesses. We were the ones who saw and knew him. We, we know what we are talking about. Now, there's lots of groups out there that like to, to claim to have apostles today. For example, the Mormons claim to have 12 apostles just like Jesus did. But the 12 apostles were really clear on what the requirements were. You had to be there from John's Baptist to Christ's Ascension. I can guarantee you that not a single LDS apostle is that old. None of them were alive for John's baptism. None of them actually saw Christ's Ascension. And you can't say, well, we saw it with our spiritual eyes. You can't say, oh, well, it was revealed to us that this is uh, truth or something like that. No, that wasn't the requirement. They had to be legally viable representatives. 
They had to have actually seen it. If you get up on the witness stand and saw, say, I saw it with my spiritual eyes, you're going to be laughed off the stand. That was the understanding of these people. These were legally viable witnesses who had been with Jesus for a considerable period of time. To make somebody else an apostolic successor, to say that somebody else could be an apostle, somebody who wasn't there, is completely laughable from a biblical historical perspective. And it denies the historicity of the faith. Well, we are spiritually the apostles, even though we weren't really there. That's not how the early Christians understood it. They understood these as true events in history. And if you're going to speak about them, you would have better have been there for them. That being said, though, the apostles published the New Covenant much as, frankly, a modern attorney would. Your attorney is someone who's making your case for you. But an attorney hardly ever does everything be, um, just through his own argumentation in court. Instead, a good attorney is going to gather uh, witnesses to testify on your behalf, and this is exactly what the apostles did. And this is how we get uh, the New Covenant, the, the New Testament. They gathered eye and ear witnesses of Christ, and be specific about that, an eye witness is someone who had actually seen Christ themselves, an ear witness is someone who had uh, come to know because of what they were told uh, by an eyewitness. So eyewitness saw it themselves, an ear witness is someone who, is someone who heard from someone who saw it themselves. So basically first or second hand knowledge and that was it. That was uh, the legal standard and you can go back to Leviticus 5.1 that talks about um, either having seen it or have coming to know, but that was the understanding is it couldn't be removed too far. And this is also what the, the ancient sources talk about. Uh, Tertullian talks about this specifically relative to the Gospels. Um, and then there's also a few other ancient sources that talk about this concept that, uh, that uh, the apostles um, used other people who were writing about these things and they author, authorized them. It was done under their authority uh, in a sense. Um, but of course, the apostles didn't live forever. And this is also something that is somewhat contrary to some uh, groups. For example, the, the Mormons believe that uh, the Apostle John is still around. But of course, Christian history records quite the opposite. The, uh, Christian history is really clear that uh, the Apostle John died in Ephesus. So all of them died. And what that means is that there is no longer any legally viable representatives of Christ anymore. And so that ended the New Testament. The New Testament does not contain any of the words of the final prophet himself. It's not written by the final prophet himself. It does contain his words, yes, but not written by him. Instead, he did it through attorneys, through legal representatives. And they, uh, to gather together the whole case for Christ, used eyewitnesses and earwitnesses, as well as some of their own writings. And these is the body of material that is the New Covenant. This is the body of material that proclaims what the uh, final prophet did in fulfilling the righteousness of God. The first covenant declares the righteousness of God. The second covenant fulfills the righteousness of God. All right, and then last but not least, we talk about the pre-schism period. I'll get into what the pre-schism period exactly is a little bit more uh, next time, but basically it's an early Christian period, the early Christian period. And in the early Christian period, you have some other uh, writings that get written. Uh, the first group is from a group called the Apostolic Fathers. Now, this is uh, apostolic with a little a, because these people are not apostles themselves. But they had known the apostles. And they wrote um, various things, various treatises and analogies to help people who were coming into this, uh, this faith understand what it's about and under, help people who are on the outside of faith understand what it's about so on and so forth um, the shepherd of Hermas falls into this category Barnabas falls into this category first and second Clement fall into this category um, these are all very important historic documents but they're not considered a part of the canon because they were not written under the proper authority first and foremost the legal representatives of Christ had died by this period or were not around for where these people were writing, because some of them were a little bit earlier, but they weren't writing under the, uh, under the direct oversight of the apostles. Um, 
So that's the first reason why they're not in the canon, but also just because of the nature of the writings themselves. They're all secondary. They're all dealing with other issues that are out there. They're dealing with how people perceive this and this kind of uh, thing. They're all secondary in nature. They're all after the fact. They're all instructive. They're basically those commentaries, but they don't replace the canon itself. And this is what we saw with the Old Testament as well, with the books like Sirach and Fourth Maccabees and those kinds of ones. They're instructive, they can be very useful, but they do not take the place of the canonical writings. And But and then there were also other groups of people out there that noticed that there was lots of questions that were left unanswered in the New Testament. For example, the New Testament doesn't go into a ton of detail about exactly what hell is going to be like. So there were uh, a group of people who wrote the Apocalypse of Peter to satisfy that need to figure out what hell was going to be like. Um, then there's also Paul's uh, uh, vision. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, specifically in verse 2, Paul talks about a vision of someone who was caught up to the third heaven. Most people think that it was Paul himself. Um, and so it's called Paul's vision. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul never really goes into any detail on it. But people wanted to know, so they basically made up a story to fill in the gaps. And that was when it was actually made much later. That when it was made in the 4th century. It just kind of pops into existence there. A lot like the Mormon uh, Book of Mormon pops into existence in the 1800s without any precursor whatsoever in the historical record. You know, it was hidden and tucked away for a while, and then we suddenly rediscovered it, one of those things. Uh, and then there's also the various infancy Gospels. Those were written because people were curious about Jesus' childhood, which the Gospels don't really talk about very much. And so people filled in the childhood of Jesus. Wasn't that so nice of them? But again, these are things that people take little side issues. The Bible doesn't talk about them very much, they're a minor issue in the Bible. Not a lot of detail there, but people instead make them into a, a big detail in their own lives. This is the same problem that we had with the Old Testament books, like you know, in Genesis chapter six, where it talks about uh, the sons of man and the uh, and the daughters of men. Sorry, the sons of God and the daughters of men. It's just a couple little lines there in the text. And people wound up making you know whole books on it. Same issue here. There's this little detail here or this little detail here that people want fleshed out, and so they make all of these books on it. But that's not appropriate. First and foremost, all of these writings are late. late. Apocalypse of Peter is 2nd century. Paul's vision is 4th century. Infancy Gospels are 2nd century, clear up to like 9th, 11th century. Some of them are written much, much later. Um, but none of them come from the right time period. They're all uh, not given by an authoritative source, and they all represent an improper attitude. Instead of majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors, they're instead dogmatizing about things that are uncertain in the main text itself. Their focus isn't right. And then last but not least, there are some heretical groups that are out there that go through and they would actually write some of the works of their own or sometimes they would change uh, works. For example, Marcion took the Gospel of Luke and he basically edited it to teach what he wanted it to teach very clearly secondary uh, and everybody knew it and it was well known in history that this is something that happened afterwards. Marcion is a second century fellow. Um, then there's also On the Origin of the World that is second century uh, later as well and it's just kind of a weird uh, work but it comes later is the main point. And then there's the Gospel of Thomas which not only comes later but it in and of itself represents a, a very clearly different attitude. Um, I'll actually read part of the Gospel of Thomas for you. This is uh, uh, saying 52, or Logion 52 in uh, the Gospel of Thomas. This is speaking of Jesus. It says, His disciples said to him, Twenty-four prophets have spoken in Israel, and they all spoke of you. So the disciples come to Jesus and they say, um, We know that you're, uh, you're uh, the one because you've been prophesied in the Old Testament. That's what the reference to the 24 prophets was, the 24 books of the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, Later on, the Hebrews started counting their books as uh, 24 books. And so that's what's being referred to here. And then Jesus responds to them, You have disregarded the living one who is in your presence and has spoken of the dead. What Jesus is effectively saying there is that you guys are focusing on the past and you're not focusing on uh, the present. You don't need to worry about what they said back there. You just need to listen to me now. That is a very, very different Jesus than the Jesus of the New Testament. In the New Testament, 
in Luke 24 specifically, we have Jesus walking his disciples through the Old Testament to show them the Messiah of the Old Testament so that they would realize that he is the Messiah of the Old Testament. He held himself accountable to what had came before. The Gospel of Thomas, on the other hand, says you don't need to be held accountable to what has uh, come before. It's a very fundamentally different message. One set of scripture says that the standard, the criterion of agreement is absolutely essential. These later works, Gospel of Thomas is second century, they say, no, we don't need to hold with what was given to us before, we just need what we have now. The standard of agreement doesn't apply. Fundamentally different, fundamentally later uh, work, and that's why it's not in the, in the canon. It comes after the time of the apostles, the legal representatives of Christ, of the final prophets that he chose to represent him to publish his gospel, comes after that time. So it's not authoritative in the first place, but it also preaches something that is fundamentally different. And it violates that core principle of being in agreement with what was previously established. Fundamental problem there. All right, so those are the first four periods that we're going to talk about. We've talked about the Old Testament period, the Intertestamental period, the New Testament period, and then the first part of the pre-schism period, basically what happened right after the New Testament. I want you guys, uh, on your own time, uh, to pick just one of those, just one, and then describe it in your own words. You might think about what were the main things that happened. Uh, and particularly, how did this relate to the canon? Is this a time period that gave us more works to the canon? Is this a time period uh, that could lead to canon confusion that uh, added works, but they weren't necessarily canonical works? And then also, just what was interesting to you about that time period? Uh, I noticed on the slide here, I forgot the, the question mark on that one. Instead, I put a period. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but take some time uh, to really kind of dig into this a little bit. Not a, not a ton. Please don't write me a 10-page paper or something like that. A little paragraph is just fine. But pick one of those time periods and just describe it in your own words. What was significant about it? What happened relative to the books of the Bible there? Uh, what was interesting to you about it? So on and so forth. Those kinds of things. Um, that's the end of uh, part two of So You Want to Know About the Bible. I thank you very much for your time and your attention. Uh, go with God and be blessed.